This is Umar Ahmed for IFL TV, proudly sponsored by Everlast. The huge occasion for Chantel Cameron uh, this Saturday night at the O2. Obviously, I'm with trainer Jamie Moore. Um, obviously, a disappointment at Dylan White's not on the bill for the wider audience. But from a selfish point of view, was she slightly pleased about this, Jamie? Were you slightly pleased uh, about this? I, I was pleased at the show we're going ahead, not just for Chantel, but for everyone. Um, because when you get that close to the fight, all your preparations basically done. You know, you've put all the work in and you want to reap the re rewards from it. So it was, I'm glad the show went on for everyone. Um, obviously, like you say, it was disappointing that Dylan couldn't fight, but uh, it created an opportunity for Chantel to be able to top the bill. Um, I was sort of hoping Eddie would do it because, you know, even though um, Chantel's not the name that uh, Dylan is, that she's a world champion in her own right. Uh, Mary McGee's a world champion, and it was a uni unification fight with the ring magazine belt on the line as well. So, uh, so yeah, it made sense to me. Was there any doubts that the show might not go ahead? Well, for a few hours, I was sort of worrying, going, oh, I hope it doesn't get pulled. But then, when I was sort of talking to the management team in, in the match room, they were sort of confident that it was going to go ahead. And uh, a few hours down the line, we sort of started saying, yeah, we can, we're going to move ahead with it. So, um, Chantel was a bit worried and then as soon as I found out I told her and she was she was over the moon uh, top of the bill first time well we are going ahead with it and it's 48 hours till she goes in the ring with Mary what are you expecting from Mary? Um, I'm, I'm expecting a gutsy performance I think it's going to have to be for, for, for her to, to be in there and compete with Chantel even because I know how good Chantel is and how strong she is I know how how higher work rate is and, and those are things that you know combined together are really hard to contain um, Mary's a good puncher so that should keep Chantel honest to a certain extent but Chantel's got a good chin and she's 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 actually been chomping at the bit for a fight like this because a lot of the time it takes Chantel two or three rounds to to get a foothold in the fight contain her opponent and actually start to overwhelm them and then they sort of go into a shell and just go into survival mode I don't think that's going to be the case um, on Saturday I think Mary's going to going to give Chantel more problems than anybody ever has in terms of something to think about with, with her punching power but I think ultimately she won't back down from Chantel she won't go into a shell and, and just go to survive she'll keep trying to win which in itself will present Chantel with more options. So, uh, so I think it's going to be explosive while it lasts, but and I think it's going to be exciting for the for the fans. But um, I can't see anything else but a Chantel Cameron win. Okay, well listen, we'll find out this Saturday night. Tune into the zone um, to see that fight, Jamie. Of course, this was a an upbeat moment that Chantel was still fighting and the show was going ahead. Obviously, not really the case with uh, your man Jack Cattrall. Um, and his undisputed fight um, in December 18th, which will now be end of February. Um, how much has that changed things for Jack? It, it, it was just disappointing for him. You can imagine he's waited so long, gets a date, and then you know a few weeks down the line, he sort of gets postponed again. Um, I say I say again, gets postponed. It's only the first time he's had a date, um, but it's not the end of the world. You know, it's ten weeks, and it, of of course the initial disappointment. Um, was mm. sickening for him, but a couple of days later, he's dusted himself off. He's back in the gym, ticking over, and um, and it's, it just means that we just delay sort of the start of actual full training camp. Doesn't mean that we can't still work on stuff technically, and, and you know sort of get those little um, tactics imprinted in his brain earlier than, or, or for longer period, I should say, than we would have got initially. So it's not it's not the end of the world and. These things happen in boxing. You know, injuries happen in boxing. And look at Dylan White, what's just happened with him. Um, I was plagued with injuries myself as a fighter. So I understand it probably a little bit more than other people do. I get it, it happens. Um, but this, we, we, we crack on and, you know, I don't think for any stretch of the imagination, Josh Taylor would pull out for no reason. So, so yeah, he'll get himself right. We actually had a bit of a conversation on DM on Twitter just said you know um, it's about something else and just said oh you, you look well uh, and he just said listen these things happen mm. apologies to the camp but you know I'll be back as soon as I can and, and the fire go ahead 
So there's no ill feeling. Um, there's a lot of respect there, actually. I think there's a lot of respect between the two fighters. Um, we understand how good Josh is, but I think Josh has got a lot of respect for Jack, and, and he's not underestimating him in the slightest, I can tell. So um, so it's, it's going to be a little fight. Well, at least Top Rank have got that date sorted early for next year, so we can look forward to that yeah. after Christmas. Uh, Jamie, as you said there, Josh Taylor, you believe there was no kind of weird reason why he pulled out. There was a few suggestions he might be tight the weight, etc. But I mean, we're still what ten weeks out from that date, so. Um, but I mean, I'm sure he is tight the weight, <laughs> but, but all fighters are tight the weight. That's not an excuse to pull out of a fight. It's, it's insane, and you know, people come up with these um, reasons for people pulling out of fights because they want to believe that that's the case. You know, I'm sure Jack's fans were really disappointed, as were we, and they go, you know, there's no way he's pulled out of that fight because he's injured. This has probably happened, and they come up with their, their own excuses, but I've no doubt it's a legitimate reason, and, you know, 90%, 99% of, of fights getting cancelled because of injuries are legitimate. That's just, just, just the nature of the sport, but there's nothing you can do. What do you think about the accusations towards Dylan White? about him having a fake injury. Exactly the same thing. Now, think about this. Um, you're Dylan White, you've waited, I don't know what it is, 300 and 400 days for a world title shot. You take a risky fight and then you get injured. Do you honestly think that Dylan White is going to risk his mandatory position to go into a fight, a risky fight at this stage, it, a risky fight it doesn't have to take with an injury. Why would he do that? So when you look at it logically, it's all right with coming up with conspiracy theories going, ah, you know, he's done this because it was a dangerous fight and that's why I didn't want it because Tyson Fury's won now and can, he was going to get the winner of that fight anyway. So he's not going to pencil in a fight to keep busy and not take it because a certain fight has won. He was going to win. He was going to fight the winner anyway. So it doesn't make sense. I'm sure he wanted to keep busy because when he does get his opportunity, he wants to be in the best form he can be because he's waited for so long. So no doubt he wanted to fight, but but now he's not been able to fight with an injury, and now he's probably going to be put made mandatory, and they're going to put it out to purse bids and stuff. Mm. Why, why would he then jeopardise that? It doesn't make sense. So when you look at it from a logical point of view like that. Of course, he was probably injured. Why would he have took the fight in the first place? But then now this scenario's unfolded. Why would he go fight him anyway? It wouldn't make sense to me. If and when the WBC called that mandatory, how do you see that fight going between Fury and White, Jamie? I don't see any heavyweight on the planet beating Tyson Fury in the form he's in. So that's obviously not a slight on Dylan White. I just think that he, Tyson Fury's got the kryptonite for every heavyweight on the planet at the moment. Um, he's, he's so versatile, um, he's so awkward, he uses his attributes to, the, to his full extent, but there's, not, there's, there's only two or three heavyweights on the planet what I would pick against Dylan White, the rest of them I think he beats and, and, and he doesn't have any problems with him. Um, but Tyson Fury is a different kettle of fish at this moment in time. Okay, and sticking with the heavyweight division, just the last one from me for tonight, Jamie. Um, we saw in the fight against Usyk, Joshua had obviously Rob McCracken as head trainer. You had the voice of Joby Clayton there as well, and Angel Fernandez. Um, I don't know if you saw Coogan's interview with Joshua uh, the other day, but he stated that he went to Ronnie Shields' gym. Um, he went to Virgil Hunter's gym, Eddie Reynoso, and Robert Garcia's gym, yeah. but has not said that he will leave Rob McCracken. Now, there's obviously an opportunity or potential situation where he's got multiple trainers, which he already has now. Um, what do you think about like, top trainers and a couple of them, three of them, maybe being involved in Joshua's career? Because he said he, he might just keep moving and switching and he's not going to stick to one. I, don't, I just think it, it can't, it, there's no sort of settlement there in, in, in that scenario. I said this earlier on and I said it yesterday as well. AJ going out there educating himself he's got to be a good thing you know if he's not if, he, if he's not going over there to look for a trainer but he's going over there to sort of gain experience fighters do that yeah. all over the world every day so it's just that he's doing it under a massive magnifying glass that's the only difference so people know that he's doing that and he's actually been open about it and said yeah that's what I've done but 
to get the best out of any fight, so just let's forget it's Anthony Joshua for one second. And you said, right, okay, we're going to have a head trainer, but we're also going to have two or three different trainers, and we're not really all going to be on the same page. We're going to have our own ideas, and the main trainer is going to try and get his point across as best he can. But at the same time, the other two, three trainers are going to have their own ideas, and they're all going to be trying to get their point across at the same time. You go, are you fucking mad? That's not a good scenario. So, so now bring that back into the equation and go, well, that's Anthony Joshua. I understand he needs help because Ron McCracken can't be there all the time. But Ron McCracken needs to bring someone on board then who's on the same page as him, who, who they're all singing off the same hymn sheet and they go, right, while I'm away, as long as we're all doing the same thing, then that's no problem. I don't know whether that is the scenario or not, but it just seems to be very confusing at the moment and there's too many people giving instruction mm. so it doesn't seem like it's a settled um, a settled way of going about the, the job and if, in little snippets of, it, of that interview you can see he sort of knows what the, the pathway he wants to go down he's sort of going do you know what I want to well, sort of go back to the streets and go fuck it I'm just going to go and throw it on him. George Foreman tweeted it before. He, he said, AJ is such an experienced fighter and he could probably teach us all something. Basically, all he needs is a bit of conditioning and uh, determination. He, kn he, he knows how to win that fight. He doesn't need three or four different people telling him how to do it. And I've said this a few times in different interviews now. I don't feel like he he needs to leave Ron McCracken or he should leave Ron McCracken because he's been the one stable thing you know, in his boxing life so far I just think he needs one game plan and, and a one trap mind know what he's supposed to be doing have a little bit of adjustment here and there if you need to off Rob and, and just fucking go through with the game plan just go for it and you know U6 going to be so difficult to beat anyway you can't be going in there with confusion be committed to your game plan, one trap minded, go in there, give it your fucking best. If you come up short, you can always hold his hands up and go, listen, I tried my best, I give it a bit of a better goal than I did last time because we sort of got the game plan wrong. But you know what? We, we give it a good goal. You'll have no regrets then. Mm. I was just going to say that, for example, with Jack Cattrall, if you then had another top trainer on board whilst you were working with him, would, could that even work? Like, well, Obviously, you've got Nigel Travis with you, but I'm talking about, say, someone the, from America, a top yeah, trainer. Well, well, you see, so, and, and, and that, so, so that's a great example. So, if I, I, I'm coaching Jack Carroll for the Josh Taylor fight, we've got an idea and we both agree in the best way to go about the job is this way. Nigel has been by my side all the way through. We've, been, we've come through all of his gym together. We're basically on the same page. Um, so... Like when I go away, when I came, when I come up here a couple of days earlier, I don't even have to say anything to Nige about, listen, make sure you do this or they do that with a certain fighter in our gym. Because we're always together and we're all on the same page. We're in the gym at the same time, all the time. And we're always on the, on the same wavelength. So imagine bringing in an American coach who will then have his own opinion, and rightly so, because everybody's entitled to their own opinion on how Jack Carroll can beat Josh Taylor, but it's different than mine. Straight away then, so it's just for argument's sake, we're in January now, and it's 10 weeks from the fight. Jack Carroll, in his mind, we've got the game plan nailed down, and he goes, right, let's get going. But I brought this American guy in for a bit of extra support, and he goes, listen, you know what, I think you should do this. And then Jack starts going, yeah, you know what? That sort of half sounds like a good idea, but that's not what we was planning. I wonder if that'll work. Straight away, he's second-guessing himself. Even though, a minute before, he was committed to what he was doing before. Mm -hmm. So, if, you're, if your plan is only 70% right, but you're 100% committed, you're probably gonna win, because you'll go for, you'll, fighters, fighters are so determined and one-track-minded, as long as you've got them focused and 
willing to go through whatever it takes, they'll, they'll do it. So, if he's second guessing himself, that's not focus. That's confusion. That's like, uh, that's, that's questioning your, your, yourself, your own ability. So, you need that one track mindedness. And uh, so, 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 it just wouldn't work, would it? You, you, your fighter can't be settled if he's getting instructions off two different people with different instructions. It's just impossible to me. Okay, Jamie Moore, appreciate your time here on IFL TV. Just a quick shout out uh, for tomorrow night, the MTK show. Tell us who you got on. Yeah, I've got, uh, well, first of all, I've got Laurent Harrison on. He's uh, Oliver's son and he's making his debut, 19 year old. So uh, I'm excited about that. It's going to be a, it's going to be an emotional one, but um, it's something we've been looking forward to for a while. I've got Sean McGoldrick on there, yeah. who, who should have boxed three weeks ago and they couldn't get him matched up, so they shifted him onto this bill. And then we've got Tursen Baker Lapmet. He is a, he's a Kazakh sensation, and um, the plan is to have him fighting for a world title in the not too distant future. He's now, I think he's 4 0 now. So, uh, so yeah, he's a hot prospect and he's going to be excited to watch. You know, I don't think there's many people jumping at the opportunity to fight him. Uh. No, it's not. It's tough. Yeah, it's difficult to match up, but uh, because like, he's only had four fights and we're, we're trying to move him into sort of world class opposition and no one wants to risk that against someone as few fights as Tursen, so it is difficult, but they're doing a good job matching him. Well, tune into the MTK show to see Jamie's boys and obviously the rest of the guys on the uh, MTK card live on IFL Friday night at York Hall. Jamie, also good luck with Chantel on Saturday. We'll catch you word after the fight, all right? Top man. Cheers, man.